I'm Claire Edwards from Brain Smart People Development, and you're listening to Raw Authentic Leadership, a series of conversations, insights, and inspirations with leaders who are real, raw, and authentic. Today's first episode for 2024 is a little different. I recently launched my white paper, The Social Factor, The Science Behind the Future of Effective People Leadership. And today I present it to you in audio format, as some people prefer to listen than to read. I'll put the links to where you can download the white paper in the show notes and where you can complete the social hierarchy of needs self-assessment. And they are included in the audio as well. If you're a regular listener to Authentic Leadership, you'll know that I'm quite fussy about who I have on as a guest, because I want to stay true to the brand of being real, raw and authentic. So, if you work for a leader or are a leader who fits this criteria, then please suggest them or offer yourself up to be a guest and share your wisdom with others so that they can develop in their leadership journey. Thanks, and without further ado, here's the audio version of The Social Factor. Executive Summary Our world of work has changed beyond all expectations and there is no going back. The levels of complexity we now face with regards to the future of work, talent acquisition, employee well-being and modern day leadership demands all make for a challenging, ever-changing landscape to navigate, and our maps are outdated. Of all the elements of leadership to reflect on and prioritise, I believe that how we manage, lead, develop, engage and inspire people to be the best version of themselves and become an invaluable asset to the business is a priority second to none. Look, when you think about it, without the people to do the work, businesses can't operate, flourish or thrive. The Social Factor is a white paper that explores and brings to the surface the often unconscious drivers of human behaviour and shares how knowledge of these drivers can help leaders to create environments for their people that build and sustain, amongst others, a sense of unshakable safety and trust. Genuine empowerment, clear expectations, fairness and equity, a culture of reward and recognition, and a tribal depth of connection that all significantly impact and drive better outcomes for all. These drivers have one thing underpinning them, the workings of our amazing brain and its key organizing principle. What drives our behaviour and influences our hierarchy of values is presented in the form of a model of core social needs, the social model. And social is an acronym for six domains of interpersonal experience that, when fulfilled, propel us forward with motivation and energy, and when compromised or withdrawn, have us retreat into self-protection, risk aversion and negativity. The future of work reinvented. The COVID-19 pandemic was the first significant global collective experience of our lifetime and has resulted in a significantly different playing field to understand and master. Key changing conditions of this new VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world include but are definitely not limited to, a gap in understanding and perspectives between what leaders believe employees value most and what workers really want in this new world of work. A balance of power shifting from employer to employee, or as Gartner puts it, a correction of power with employees rethinking their relationship with work at a very fundamental level. New codes of practice regarding managing psychosocial hazards at work, requiring HR and health and safety teams to work together to identify risks and plan new strategies for consultation and management. 
ambiguity around the new hybrid working model, with workers wanting greater flexibility and employers struggling to find a balance of control versus trust. And finally, a need to refocus on people leadership, as during the pandemic, organisations had to focus on safety, now both phys physical and technological, and logistics, for example, shifting to remote working, leaving managers and leaders struggling to deal with challenges never before experienced, most of which are interpersonal, and resulting for many in post-pandemic stress, and that sources the World Health Organization. Challenges are complex and varied, leaving many leaders feeling isolated and underskilled to deal with such a broad and ambiguous scope of requirements. One key recommendation to come out of the Gartner Insights report of March 22, which is called The Future of Work Reinvented, Managing in a Hybrid World, was the importance of empathic leaders who can navigate difficult conversations and foster team cohesions, inclusion and psychological safety in a hybrid work environment. The modern day people leadership journey. As we look at these leadership challenges, for many leaders and people managers, it can feel overwhelming with no previous case studies or benchmarks to refer to and continued pressure to deliver strong business outcomes, stay competitive and retain and grow talent in an exceptionally tight labor market. As someone who lives in a country with a surf culture and enjoys metaphors, let's look at the modern day people leadership journey through a nautical lens. The bottom layer we have is crisis. Many leaders faced with the requirements to perform in this new world are finding themselves in crisis. This sense of overwhelm and chaos looks like floundering on the seabed gasping for a lung full of air, not being able to see through the murkiness all around and not knowing which way is up. Giving up seems easier than going on. In the next level up, we have concern. With every small win, they can begin to rise. They can see some light above, but are still getting dumped by the waves and struggling for air. They question their energy and their motivation and doubt their ability to surface for good. Giving up is still an option, albeit a slightly diminishing one. The next level up we have is credence. The tide is turning and there's a buoyancy vest within reach of the form of support and encouragement and practical tools. They can take a breath, face the right direction and see the situation more clearly, feeling hopeful. Giving up becomes a negative option. In our next layer up the people leadership journey, we have confidence. Out of the whitewash and with a view to the horizon, confidence builds and the focus is on working for and celebrating progress in the form of building relationships, achieving goals, and most of all, self-awareness and self-confidence. Giving up is no longer an option. And our final level is conviction. Surfing the waves and riding the storms with conviction. A sense of being unstoppable as a capable and effective leader who is making a difference. Giving up is now unthinkable and the only way is up. This is a development journey that is progressive and rewarding. The tipping point, as is shown in the model, is to get people above the waterline, shifting from a negative, self-critical mindset about their role to one that provides a clear and positive direction forwards. A journey like this requires investment in equipping people, leaders with the skills, capabilities and attitudes to build self-leadership first which starts with self-awareness. When we can understand what drives us, what triggers us and how our behavior impacts others, we can then address the challenges of overwhelm and doubt 
through self-reflection, open and honest communication, and a deeper sense of self-acceptance. When it comes to leading others, understanding what uniquely drives our people, what triggers them, and knowing what to do about it, is the ethos of the modern day leader. And many organizations will be forced to review their current leadership culture and capability if they want leaders who can encourage, develop and inspire their people to perform and consistently deliver results. There's ongoing debate about the statement that people leave their bosses and not the company. Employee experience company Culture Amp cites lack of development opportunities as the main reason. In a 2018 Harvard Business Review article about why employees left Facebook, the three key reasons were around work enjoyment, use of strengths and career advancement opportunities. What isn't disputed is the level of influence managers and leaders have on employee engagement and their need to focus on creating an environment for their people to thrive. If we're to expect increased employee retention, engagement and productivity, then we must develop our leaders to the point that people want to stay and grow with them and with the organisation. It takes investment in time, energy and commitment to develop and a realisation that these are not to be found in a couple of hours of online training or a one day off site, but rather a planned and structured commitment to ongoing leadership development at all levels, utilising both formal and informal approaches. The changing face of leadership the face of leadership is changing rapidly. 21st century or modern day leadership is emerging as people centric and society focused. So think sustainable development goals, ESG and net zero initiatives, for example. The focus on finding meaning and purpose in our work and making a difference, no matter the service or product, is the driver of the new generations. We're moving away from the concept of human resources, you know, humans as resources, to seeing people as the most valued of assets on any balance sheet. The power dynamic has shifted and people are looking to join organisations that will invest in them, listen to their ideas, freely exchange feedback, encourage a portfolio career and communicate openly and transparently. Leadership is becoming democratised, less top-down, more distributed, where everyone can be a leader of themselves first, of others, and of the impact that they have on their organisation. If we take the example of authoritarian command and control style leadership, unless in crisis mode where it may be appropriate, People will no longer tolerate having their freedom and autonomy compromised, having their decisions questioned or overruled, being kept in the dark about significant changes, feeling scared to speak up, working in an unequitable environment, or feeling excluded and disconnected. They will vote with their feet and most likely take good people with them. As people rethink what's important to them and refuse to compromise on their needs, they'll need to seek out organisations that are actively willing to fulfil them. The victors in this war for talent will be those organisations that are growing leaders who can connect with their people deeply, empathically and authentically and who understand the growing need for finding meaning and purpose at work, either in the roles that they perform, the organisation that they belong to, or the stance it takes on societal issues. With the social age comes social leadership, which, in my opinion, will become a key differentiator in those organisations that rely on attracting, retaining and growing talent to thrive in the VUCA world. 
What is social leadership? There's no one definition of social leadership. It's in its infancy as a concept or approach. But by its very name, it encompasses leading for the good of all, for employees, for stakeholders, and for society, through forming, building, and harnessing authentic, sustainable relationships. Though a relatively new concept, there are and have been many social leaders throughout the ages in business, sport, government, education, and the military. They have, though, been in the minority. And with changing expectations comes a need to balance the analytical head-based approach with the emotionally intelligent heart-based nature of leadership. An example of the rise of social leadership is the 100% Human at Work partnership between Virgin Unite and global non-profit The B Team, who state that where once the highest prized leadership competencies comprised strategy, analysis and execution, they're now being trumped by attributes such as humility, curiosity, resilience, generosity, kindness, collaboration, vulnerability and courage. I would add empathy to this. Social leadership starts with social awareness, one of the elements in Daniel Goleman's emotional intelligence quadrant. Goleman's definition of social awareness is the ability to accurately notice the emotions of others and read situations appropriately. It's about sensing what other people are thinking and feeling to be able to take their perspective using your capacity for empathy. The challenge. Looking at all these attributes offers one problem. We expect our leaders to be superhuman and to have all the traits of high performance leadership. And they're not because they're human. But we can help our leaders to rise above the waterline. Many leaders are not being developed in these social and emotional intelligences because of either competing priorities or these, in inverted commas, essential skills are not being perceived as that. This is particularly difficult for those people leaders who are brilliant technicians and subject matter experts, but who are struggling with the human aspect of development and they risk losing the most valuable assets in their organization to leaders in other organizations who know how to lead socially. The social model of core needs is designed to help leaders understand the individual needs of their people, what drives them to perform, what triggers them to retreat, to develop their social awareness and to create cultures of belonging and inclusion that facilitate high performance, engagement and connection. But before we address the model, let's look at the neuroscience behind it. The neuroscience of social needs. To understand this shift from head to heart a little better, it helps to go back a couple of hundred thousand years when our earliest of ancestors were roaming the African savannah plains. To survive and to continue the line of heritage, we had certain core needs that if not met, could result in the end of our lineage, and when met, could have resulted in descendants still roaming the planet today. Some of these core needs included certainty. If we didn't know where the enemy tribe was lurking or where the lion had its lair, we could well become the next day's meal. Importance. If we were lower down the pecking order, then no one wanted to procreate with us. End of story. So we needed to assert ourselves and our standing in the tribe. Fairness. We would fight for fair. If another tribe took our precious resources in whatever form, there would be immediate and permanent repercussion. Belonging. Cast out today, lunch tomorrow. We couldn't survive alone. Today, these core needs still exist, albeit in different forms, and we want them fulfilled both inside and outside our work environments. 
Our brain's negativity bias. Our ancestors didn't survive by being optimistic and hopeful. That got them killed. They developed a bias for seeking out danger and staying safe, or staying alive. And of course, we're descended from the ones who did that rather well. Still today, we have around five times more neurons dedicated to scanning for danger and safety than for seeking pleasure. And this is mostly unconscious, about every five seconds. For example, look, seeing a wavy looking stick, brain says, snake. Or seeing a shadow in a dark alley, brain says, murderer. From a work perspective, this is evident in communication. For example, hearing that there are going to be some changes around here. Or seeing an unexpected message from your boss. Can I see you in my office now, please? You probably aren't jumping for joy thinking it's a promotion. There's a saying in the world of social cognitive neuroscience that our brains are like Teflon to the positive and Velcro to the negative. We see this almost on a daily basis when it comes to leading others through change. The good news is that we can change our brains and readjust the negativity bias. The social brain. Our brains are social organs, continually communicating with other brains, trying to read what's going on with other people and wanting to be included and accepted within our tribes. This is why social isolation during the pandemic was so painful for so many, even for the most introverted. We were separated from our tribe and to our brains that was potentially life-threatening and caused us significant social pain. This is also why solitary confinement is considered the worst of punishments for prisoners. Of all the species on the planet, humans are the most social, according to UCLA neuroscientist Matthew Lieberman in his book Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Connect. He says, becoming more socially connected is essential to our survival. In a sense, evolution has made bets at each step that the best way to make us more successful is to make us more social. Unlike many other species, we are born incapable of looking after ourselves and are totally dependent on our caregivers. Lieberman suggests that because care is our most fundamental need, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is actually out of order with love and belonging, i.e. social needs, being the foundational layer. Social leadership acknowledges and embraces this fundamental need to belong and to be loved, and that the need to give care is not exclusive to the home environment. When care is not given, it hurts, literally. The role of social pain, why being excluded can hurt more than a kick in the stomach. In 2012, social cognitive neuroscientist Naomi Eisenberger identified that physical and social pain share similar neural circuitry. This means that when we experience social pain, it hurts literally. Examples of social pain include rejection, ridicule, shame, derision, abandonment, isolation, loss, exclusion, embarrassment, and probably much more. Through a series of experiments where participants in functional MRI machines played a virtual ball game, after a while they instructed two of the players to exclude the third player and examine the brain of the one who was excluded from the game. In the very first experiment, the participant who was excluded was later interviewed and despite knowing that this was an experiment, was visibly triggered and emotions were high. Imagine this translating to the world of work where people experience social pain in many different forms and on a frequent basis. One key difference is that with social pain, 
Retrieving the memory activates a more visceral and emotional response than with physical pain. Think back to when you last had a physical injury and recall it. Now think back to the memory of, say, a relationship breakup, being left out of a group or, or the loss of a loved one and notice your response. This is why being rejected can hurt more than a kick in the stomach. We're often unaware of the potential for causing social pain at work. For example, we might inadvertently offer someone a place on a project team and not see the impact on the other person who was desperately hoping that they would be the one chosen. Or we might think that we're empowering someone by delegating a task that we haven't fully briefed them on. And the result for them is paralysis, fear of looking incompetent, an embarrassment that causes them to freeze and retreat, or worse still, leave. In haste, we might forget to give credit to someone for their work or forget to include them in a meeting because they're working remotely. The possibilities are endless the consequences lasting. Telling our brains to toughen up is not the answer. The brain's threat and reward response. Experiencing or causing any form of social pain can create a threat response in our brain. The role of our brain is to keep us safe. And the underlying premise of social pain is, I'm not safe here. Our brains will respond in ways to keep us safe. And that can often show up as things like unsociable behaviour, moods, or in inverted commas, poor attitudes. But in reality, our unconscious reactions to perceived threat. Now there's a model here, and I'm going to read you a list of what perceived threats might look like. So this is from a model, the brain's threat and reward response, examples of symptoms. Reduced memory, muddled thinking, narrowed focus, distracted, anxious and stressed, risk averse, negative and pessimistic, reserved, defensive, forgetful, self-preserving, won't speak up. Suspicious and closed, decreased performance. Having someone working in threat mode is, of course, detrimental to productivity, as when in threat mode, we have less access to our brain's executive function, with the emotional networks performing their job of safety officer. So now I'm going to read you the symptoms um, of the reward response. Access to clear thinking, more ideas for action, broader focus, access to insight, willing to collaborate, innovative and creative, positive and optimistic, collaborative, attentive, safe to speak up, trusting, curious and open, resilient and calm increased performance. As leaders, picking up on these often unconscious signals is an acuity skill to develop, but one that can make the difference between having a disengaged team member or an actively engaged and fully productive one. When we make the unconscious conscious and help people to understand that these are natural human ways of reacting, we can then help them to develop and implement strategies to minimize their threat response and maximize their reward response. The main focus of the model I'm about to present is to help leaders and their people to create an environment of minimizing threat and maximizing reward. The social model of core needs. In 2008, David Rock, the founder of the neuroleadership movement, created his SCARF model to illustrate five domains of social experience or needs or values that, when fulfilled, activate a reward response in our brains 
and when withdrawn or compromised, activate a threat response. His work complements that of Eisenberger and Lieberman, and his model is now used extensively in organisations developing their people. Fifteen years on, and with greater insight into what drives our behaviour, I built on SCARF, creating the social model for the betterment of developing social leaders and as a framework for leading people successfully in a VUCA world. Key differences in the model. The R in Rock's SCARF model is relatedness, a sense of safety with others. I split this out and created two separate domains. Safety, both physical and psychological, and love, in brackets connection, the need to belong to a tribe. I established that each is equally important and slightly different, deserving its own place in the hierarchy. The S in SCARF is status, and that becomes importance in the social model and focuses slightly more on a sense of validation, recognition and value than, than one's place in a hierarchy or social standing. Though these are still both valid and of significance to many, for example, job titles, credentials and a strong need to advance in seniority. On this page, I have an example of the social model with the six domains of safety, objectivity, certainty, importance, autonomy, and love. The acronym social reflects the way we want to be led in the 21st century. We're social beings, our brains are social organs, and each of the needs in the model is related to our social, interpersonal experiences. Rock refers to each element of his SCARF model as domains of experience. From my experience of using the model with clients, I'm using the term needs as I've seen firsthand the impact on motivation, morale and well-being when these needs are not met, compromised or withdrawn, and vice versa when they are. As you start to read through each of the needs, or in this case, listen to them, you'll discover that they're all interrelated, which means that focusing on one can have a ripple effect on the others. There are multiple ways we can reduce threat responses and increase reward responses. And for the purpose of illustration, I've highlighted just one strategy for each need. I use social in many of my professional development programs where we do a deep dive, identifying all the ways we can, and often inadvertently, create social threats in the workplace. And we then discuss what actions we can take to minimize those threats and increase rewards. These are facilitated sessions where my clients are the ones identifying the threats and rewards unique to them. Scope of the model. The six needs identified in the model relate to our brain's threat and reward responses. The model, of course, doesn't cover every aspect of effective people leadership, though there are correlations between some needs and other elements of people leadership. For example, um, mastery, achievement, goal setting and career advancement can be correlated with importance and autonomy. Remuneration can be correlated with importance and objectivity. Performance management can be correlated with all needs. There's, and I will talk about later, um, balancing the focus on people and performance. This is very much interrelated. The components of the social model. S is for safety the need to be physically and psychologically safe. I have a voice. Safety first. Remember that the job of our brain is to keep us safe. Safety in this context relates to both physical and psychological safety. 
The need for physical safety was highlighted during the pandemic, of course, with office closures, social distancing and mask wearing. When it was time to return to the office, many people were physically afraid to do so. And a new acronym came into our vernacular, FORTO, fear of returning to the office. Regardless of the industry, a proactive focus on physical safety shows care and concern, supporting all the elements of social. When it comes to psychological safety, the need to be our authentic selves at work, to have a voice and to speak up without fear of repercussion is paramount. Psychological safety is the foundation of trust. Professor Amy Edmondson of Harvard Business School defines psychological safety as a shared belief held by members of a team that it's okay to take risks, to express ideas and concerns, to speak up with questions and to admit mistakes, all without fear of negative consequences. I was a member of an executive leadership team with a tech company where one of our members demonstrated all the characteristics of a bully. None of us addressed their behaviour and few of us dared to suggest new ideas for fear of being ridiculed. As a result, innovation and creativity were stifled and we lost good people from the team. I was one of them. Creating an environment of psychological safety has been shown to deliver excellent results in business with the following improvements. 27% reduction in turnover, 76% more engagement, 50% more productivity, 74% less stress, 29% more life satisfaction, 57% of workers more likely to collaborate, 26% greater skills preparedness since workers learn at a faster rate when they feel psychologically safe and 67% higher probability that workers will apply a newly learned skill on the job and the source for those statistics can be found at the back of the white paper. And this is why we can no longer call the skills required to create these conditions soft From the 2023 Meaningful Insights Report from Beaumont People, you can see the difference the pandemic has made to people's need for safety. In 2019, 60% of people strongly agreed that physical, mental and emotional safety is essential and would leave an organisation if they didn't feel safe in that respect. This figure jumped to 70% through the pandemic. One way to minimise the threat response to a lack of psychological safety is for leaders to demonstrate genuine vulnerability and share of themselves, maybe sharing a limitation they are aware of or a past failure or mistake and the lesson that was learned. That doesn't mean, for example, suddenly divulging traumatic childhood experiences. That would most certainly be a step too far, but rather to be prepared to share of oneself, creating a permission-based culture for others to feel comfortable to follow. The O is for objectivity, the perception of fairness and justice. I am treated equitably. You only have to watch a toddler take a toy away from their playmate to know that fairness is something that we learn very early on. And there's a name for this, it's called inequity aversion. And we developed it because as the earliest of humans, we needed cooperation to survive. When we perceive that we're being treated subjectively or unfairly, there's an area of our brain called the anterior insula that is activated. The anterior insula plays an important role in the processing of bodily sensations and emotions and can be used to influence decision making. It essentially carries a map of our body. When activated in response to a lack of fairness, justice or equity, 
We have a visceral reaction. We even use that language that reflects the response. For example, the way they were treated was disgusting. Disgusting being a gustatory word. I have experienced many people leaving their jobs because of a lack of fairness or equity. Yeah, me included. What might seem an unimportant choice or decision to one can cause a significantly strong reaction in another. For example, handing a piece of work over to the person you know will do the job quickly when someone else is desperate to be offered a chance to step up. Or finding out about inequity of remuneration packages for similar roles or different genders. I used to facilitate a series of workshops that involved building relationships between managers and trade union representatives for a national power company. The mornings were always tense and adversarial, verging on the point of active conflict, until we unpacked the challenges and their root causes. And more than 80% of the time, it was down to a perception of inequity and lack of justice. And I've got a footnote here saying, notice the use of the word perception. If we perceive that we're being treated fairly and equitably, then we experience less of a threat response. And once we explored this, the bridge of understanding and acceptance slowly appeared. And by the end of the programme, participants realised that they had a common purpose on which to build. When we create an environment of objectivity and fairness, the reward networks of our brain are activated. We release dopamine as we experience being treated fairly. With greater openness and transparency, trust and connection builds and we produce additional happy hormones like serotonin and oxytocin. And the benefit of all this? A team that is open to collaboration, solution focused, and willing to try new things. It makes sense, therefore, that one way to minimise the threat response to a lack of objectivity is through openness and transparency, offering genuine reasons and explanations for the often difficult decisions we have to make as leaders. When people are actively listened to and given a genuine and sincere why, they're more likely to widen their perspective and be agreeable to decisions and outcomes. We can't always treat everyone the same, but we can create equitable and open environments and offer our people a genuine, honest reason for the decisions we make. The C is for certainty. The need to predict the future. I know what's expected. Our brains are prediction machines, constantly trying to predict unconsciously what's going to happen next. They crave certainty using similar circuits and networks that we use to crave food, water and sex for reproduction. As mentioned previously, if our earliest of ancestors didn't know where the enemy tribe was lurking or where the lion had its lair, we wouldn't be long for this earth. The drive to predict what was going to happen next is what kept us alive. Our brains receive stimuli from the outside world, storing them as memories and making predictions by combining past and present experience. Prediction is the primary function of our neocortex and, according to neuroscientist Jeff Hawkins, the foundation of intelligence. Our brains are also meaning-making machines. When they receive partial or ambiguous information, they try to close the loop to meet our expectations and fill gaps in drawing on our past experiences. This is how rumours can start, especially in times of uncertainty. For some, a lack of certainty can be paralysing and the threat response from our brain considered a threat to life itself. This is where we see typical fight, flight, freeze related behaviour, particularly in rapid or unexpected change. So it's not unusual for certainty to be the dominant need when it comes to people identifying their social needs hierarchy. 
Considering you start in an organisation, rationally the process of onboarding is about orientation, familiarity with process, policy, procedure, etc. But subconsciously, the brain of a new starter is trying to predict what life will be like in terms of all the elements of social. Will I be safe? Will I be treated fairly? Valued? Accepted? Etc. This is why information retention during the early days is poor. Our brains have a much more important job to do. I used to work for an internet service provider as head of corporate development. And in the space of a few months, we went from being hugely successful to our shares being wiped off the Nasdaq and being put up for sale. I was tasked with making a large number of people's roles redundant. And I learned a lot in that time from my boss, who was the president. Every day, he would conduct a conference call, whether, whether there was news or not. And it became the daily motivator for so many staff to keep going, and most importantly, to stay productive. The antidote I learned from Mike to minimising the threat response to a lack of certainty is frequent, unambiguous and specific communication. We sometimes assume that we've informed people sufficiently, but when we're under stress, our short-term memory is impaired. So we need to recap, to repeat, and where possible, to reassure. When we create an environment of certainty, offering clarity around roles, responsibilities and expectations, stress levels lower, freeing our people to be able to focus and concentrate on the task at hand, enjoying their role and being able to be more engaged and productive. Uncertainty is the enemy of change. Our brains are continually predicting because this is a survival instinct. I is for importance, a sense of value, status and recognition. I matter. Remember that 200,000 years ago, were we to be found at the lower end of the pecking order, no one wanted to procreate with us and so our lineage died. The need for importance is another survival instinct. When we experience being valued, recognised and acknowledged, we activate the reward networks of our brain and produce those happy hormones like oxytocin, sometimes known as the love drug or the moral molecule, because it facilitates connection and trust. We also produce dopamine, which stimulates us to want to repeat the action that caused the recognition. Helpful when that action is contributing directly to the bottom line. For example, closing a deal and getting a round of applause. Dealing effectively with an angry customer. Or submitting an idea that will save time and or money or increase revenue. It can be all too easy to overlook small gestures that can trigger our brain's threat response to our sense of importance. For example, forgetting to mention the contribution of someone on an important piece of work, not acknowledging the extra mile that someone went to when asked, or not considering the impact of a minor change of job title on someone for whom importance is high in their hierarchy of needs. In a study from The Great Place to Work, employees were asked what matters most to them and what the most important thing their manager or company currently does that would cause them to produce great work. The result that stood out was appreciation at 37%, with everything else ranking below 10%. Appreciation matters. According to the world's largest employee engagement survey, the Q10 from the Gallup organisation, there are 12 needs managers can meet to improve employee productivity. And I've mapped each of these needs to the social model um, and that mapping you can find at the end of the white paper. And of the 12 questions, more than 50% are aligned to the need for importance, validation, 
recognition. Leaders can significantly contribute to our sense of importance by doing something very simple, offering genuine, specific and timely praise. When we share why we're offering praise, it's so much more powerful than just a bland, oh, thanks for a great job. Giving and receiving specific praise activates the reward networks of both the giver and the receiver, releasing dopamine and oxytocin, which, as we know already, increases trust, motivation and connection. When we create an environment of validation, recognition and appreciation, we lift not just the motivation and morale of the individual, but that of the whole team, leaving people wanting to do a good job consistently. From the 2023 Employee Engagement Trends report from Reward Gateway, recognising employees and peers for good work is not just about being nice, it's about being restorative. And here's a quote from Stephen Covey. Always treat your employees as you would want them to treat your best customers. A. Autonomy. The perception of being at choice or in control. I am empowered. Similar to being treated objectively, it is the perception of choice that reduces our threat response. And I have yet to meet anyone who is happy to have that sense of control or autonomy withheld. When I speak about the social model, I often ask audience members if they've ever been micromanaged. And most, if not all, hands go up. I then ask how many enjoyed the experience and guaranteed every hand goes down. Withholding autonomy impacts all the other social needs and can put us into fight mode where we rebel, often leading to unwise and emotionally charged decisions. As leaders, it's important to remember that there is a fine line between offering autonomy in the form of delegation and empowerment and offloading to the degree that we cause a threat response from a lack of safety and certainty. Our sense of autonomy can be fulfilled by being offered choice. It's a strategy that parents are very familiar with. For example, what do you want to eat first? Your broccoli or your carrots? Now, in business, we, we want to do this authentically and ethically because people will see immediately if this becomes manipulative. One of the key aspects of autonomy that has become a critical success factor for employees is that of flexible working arrangements. Employees want options so that they can balance work and family commitments or health and well-being practices. And for this to happen, trust needs to be afforded with a focus on quality outcomes rather than timed and monitored inputs. Those employers who continue to restrict workplace flexibility will find a weakening in their position in this war for talent. A 2023 survey of 13,000 NAB employees stated that flexibility is high on the list of priorities and work-life balance since the pandemic, and it plays a key role in job satisfaction. A company's willingness to accommodate employee preferences goes a long way in supporting their loyalty. When I was managing the role redundancies in the call centre, the process of helping people see the options available lessened the shock and stress slightly so that they could take time to consider and make the best decisions for themselves. The most important element of choice, however, was when I started coaching those impacted to help them see the many career choices they could make because being in a heightened state of threat they couldn't see past the negative experience of losing their job, their colleagues and their security. Thanks to Mike, my boss, who was an exceptionally social leader, we crafted our approach so that we consciously tried to reduce the threat levels in all six areas of the social domain. Here are some examples. 
our communication approach reinforced psychological safety, where people felt safe to voice their anger and sadness and be able to grieve for the loss of their tribe. We focused on objectivity by being completely transparent about our chances of survival and what we could and couldn't share being publicly listed. We addressed uncertainty through hyper-communicating on a daily basis uh, about what was happening, even if there was no news. We coached people to help them see their full potential and recognised and validated them with, with many transitioning into roles far more advanced than the ones being lost. We gave people time off to go to interviews, offered outplacement services, and, as mentioned, helped them to see what was possible for their future. We were already strong in the love department, and many years later there are still frequent reunions. Leaders become great not because of their power, but because of their ability to empower others. That's a quote from John Maxwell. And finally, L, love or connection, belonging to a tribe, knowing that someone cares. I belong. As social beings with social brains, we are wired to belong, to be cared for and to connect. Even the most introverted types still need connection. And as we most likely will spend a third of our adult life at work, forging strong connections is paramount to our mental and emotional well-being our levels of engagement and productivity, and possibly the source of lifelong friends and partners. There is nowhere more evident for the need to facilitate connection and show that as leaders, we care about our people than during periods of significant change. We fear being disconnected from our colleagues. We worry that we might not be accepted if we have to move to a new team, a new tribe and we withdraw to safety and self-preservation. I have had feedback in the past from clients that were they to conduct the Gallup Q12 in their organisation, they would remove question 10, which is, I have a best friend at work, viewing it as irrelevant or of no importance to their business. Data, however, from the 2021 Workplace Friendship and Happiness Survey by Wild Goose and many other similar surveys identified that 57% of people said having a best friend in the workplace makes work more enjoyable. 22% said they feel more productive with friends and 21% said that friendship makes them more creative at work. When I was working for an IT research company, we made the decision to relocate the salespeople serving France, Spain, Italy and Germany to country satellite offices. The sales reps welcomed this move and said that it would make it so much easier for them to achieve their targets being in the country of origin. Within six months, sales plummeted as our European colleagues were slowly, albeit inadvertently, being excluded from team meetings or left out of decisions. They also fed back that they missed the camaraderie and special rituals such as the bell ringing each time we made a sale, the lunchroom banter and Friday end of week drinks at the pub. Today, of course, it's more the norm to work remotely and leaders are learning how to focus proactivity on inclusion. But a physical get together can reap rewards in belonging, engagement and inclusion, leading to increased loyalty and ultimately productivity. When I first rolled out the model, it was with a global legal firm and we ran national workshops on staying cool under pressure. Having a reputation as being driven, focused and highly dismissive of the soft and fluffy stuff, it came as a huge surprise to everyone that when I revealed the results of everyone's hierarchy of needs, in every office, love came out top because of the absence of it in the workplace. We can increase our sense of reward in this area by focusing on the little things. For example, remembering significant dates of our people and celebrating personal milestones or noticing when someone seems a little disconnected and checking in with them authentically and empathically. 
When we create an environment of care, connection and belonging, we create a genuine culture of inclusion where people want to do their best, not just for their leader, but for each other, making the whole significantly greater than the sum of its parts. Never underestimate the power of a hand on the shoulder, a social gathering at work, or a reassuring smile where you can see into someone's eyes. Our unique hierarchy of needs. We each have a unique hierarchy of social needs that can change with circumstance. For example, in unexpected change, certainty might be elevated. If we were to be embarrassed in public, it might be importance or safety. Or if treated unfairly, objectivity might come first. Other needs might be more permanent. For example, my highest need consistently is autonomy, which serves me well for being self-employed. I was working with a high-performing sales team where the ticket value of each sale was in the hundreds of thousands. And at a professional development offsite, I conducted the social hierarchy self-assessment with each team member. All but one came out top as objectivity, which raised a red flag. With permission of the manager, we opened up a discussion where we identified that juicy leads were being handed out to those salespeople who had the highest chance of closing the sale. The discussion was robust and productive with the manager explaining their reasons and processes were subsequently changed to make the system fairer. I have co-created a social self-assessment questionnaire that helps people identify their point in time hierarchy of needs. And this can be extremely helpful in uncovering specific individual and team challenges and opportunities. You can register and complete the self-assessment by visiting brain-smart.com forward slash hierarchy dash register. Applications of the social model. I've been using the social model in many of my professional development programs since 2019 to facilitate client outcomes. Its scope applies to a large range of interventions from leadership to change, resilience, self-care, team development and diversity, equity and inclusion. Once you're familiar with the social model at a deeper level, you can use it in a variety of ways and once embedded, it can become an effective conversation framework for people articulating what they need and where they're struggling and it also helps them to develop awareness of self and others. Here are some applications for using social. As a coaching tool for developing self-awareness in the coachee about their unique hierarchy of needs and also to explore challenging relationships. As a leadership development tool to help leaders develop a more individualized and inclusive people leadership approach. As part of a project kickoff to identify, create and maintain team culture and cohesion. In induction and onboarding, a start as we mean to go on approach where new recruits can have an open and honest conversation with their new manager about what makes them tick, the reward, and what puts them into stress or causes them to retreat threat. As part of a performance management conversation, this is probably the most powerful as our results are tightly correlated with our needs being met. To develop and harness team diversity and inclusion as team members share their hierarchies and what puts them into threat or rewards in terms of belonging. For identifying team challenges, Using social provides a safe framework for team members to disclose what they need and where their needs are being met or compromised. And lastly, for identifying underlying issues not being divulged, a manager can create a safe environment for their people to reveal what's troubling them and agreeing or negotiating on how better to get their needs met. A case study about using the model from WSP. WSP is a globally recognised professional services firm providing strategic, advisory, engineering and design services to clients in the transportation, infrastructure, 
environment, building, power, energy, water and resource sectors. This organisation has been a valued client since 2020 and they are deeply committed to leadership development at all levels. I've had the privilege of working with many of their leaders and I'm honoured that they have taken the model and used it widely. What follows is a description of how social is being used throughout WSP. And with special thanks to Michelle Perry, Senior Learning and Development Advisor based in Brisbane, Australia. Since 2020, we have embedded the social model as a foundational component to all management and leadership development programs. We introduced our leaders and managers to this simple yet incredibly powerful neuroscience-based framework so that they may build self-awareness of their own hierarchy of core social needs and that of the people they lead, supporting them to become connected, empathic, authentic, adaptable and social leaders. We found that building our understanding of the social model early on in our management and leadership programmes also leads to a greater understanding of the why and a direct connection with the other topics we cover. For example, building credibility and trust aligns beautifully with certainty and autonomy. Creating a culture of psychological safety, inclusion and belonging aligns to safety and love connection. Providing timely reinforcing and redirecting feedback supports objectivity and importance. Creating purpose and delegating for success aligns to love, certainty, autonomy, objectivity and importance. Managing change. As we focus people on the stages of change, we can then align each stage to the social model and provide concrete examples of how to support employees. By leveraging the social model, leaders can improve employee engagement, increase productivity and reduce turnover. The model allows us to address the fundamental social needs of our employees and create a workplace culture that fosters psychological safety, trust, motivation, engagement, performance and a sense of belonging. Balancing the focus on people and performance. Social leadership leans heavily on leading people by understanding and fulfilling their needs. It also focuses on developing people to reach their full potential through balancing the focus on performance and engagement. As I'll explain in a moment from Model 6, if we focus too much or too little on one area, we impact both productivity and engagement. Too little focus on people can result in a lack of engagement or active disengagement with low to no energy and people either stagnating or stressing to the point of burnout. Too little focus on performance, we can set people up for cruise control mode where boredom and resentment can set in and as productivity drops, people will actively resist calls for change. We need the Goldilocks approach. When we achieve the balance of both, we create motivation and drive, facilitating connections so people can find meaning and purpose in their work, which in turn creates the energy and motivation to perform. So I'll aim to explain the model here verbally. When we have on the vertical axis focus on performance and on the horizontal axis focus on people, where we're low in both, we're stagnating and signs of that are apathy, resentment, boredom, withdrawal and non-engagement. When we have a high focus on performance and a low focus on people, we have stressing that can be seen by burnout, overwhelm, fear and mistrust, disconnection and disengagement. When we have a high focus on people, but low focus on performance, we're strolling. We're in our comfort zones, status quo, ambivalence, frustration and passive engagement. But when we have the balance which is high on performance and high on people, that's where we're succeeding. We see drive, purpose and meaning, connection, energy and active engagement. 
A Gallup survey of over 8,000 employees found that when managers focus on both engagement and performance, a team has the greatest chance of reaching its full potential. The social model can be used to help balance this focus. We've covered the people element in depth, so let's take a look at how the elements can positively impact performance. Safety. In an environment of psychological safety, difficult conversations or feedback around performance can take place without fear or embarrassment. Objectivity. Creating equitable distribution of workloads or giving those who are keen and need to skill up a fair go are significant performance motivators. Certainty. Being clear about roles, responsibilities, targets and KPIs is reassuring and keeps people on track to perform. Importance. When genuine effort and improved performance are recognised, we're motivated to repeat this behaviour for reward. Autonomy. Well-planned delegation and empowerment are surefire strategies for people to take ownership of their performance. And lastly, love. Connected tribes build high performance. Team members will go out of their way to support, encourage and challenge each other to perform at their best. In conclusion, leaders have never been under greater pressure to perform and expectations are high on them to be able to juggle managing business priorities and people equally well. Talent is scarce and many of the leaders I work with are citing one of the biggest problems for them and their people is having to do more with less and the pressure is taking its toll. Burnout is on the rise and it's not something that can be cured with a week's holiday or a few yoga sessions. Those who report to leaders and managers are also suffering. The Global Workplace Burnout Study cites the primary causes of burnout at work as unfair treatment, an unmanageable workload, lack of role clarity, and lack of communication and support from a manager. The social model addresses three out of these four challenges. Whilst we can't wave a magic wand and suddenly equip our leaders to be everything to everybody, we can acknowledge that they can't do this alone and will need help from both a capability building, well-being and mental health perspective, regardless of level of seniority. No one is immune. To balance out our negativity bias, we need to focus on minimising workplace threats for people. And to do this, we need to first identify them, then develop strategies that focus on individual social needs and how to fulfil them. It requires social leadership. To be an effective people manager or social leader, we need to care deeply and genuinely about our people. We need to be interested in them and the work that they do without micromanaging and curious about their lives outside of work, but not prying. We need to want to understand what drives them, what puts them into threat, what motivates them to perform. We need to understand their strengths and harness them for peak performance. We need to be available and be a safe confidant to be approached in times of need. We need to be prepared to be vulnerable and share of ourselves through stories of personal disclosure and lessons learned. And we need to help our people find meaning and purpose in their work, regardless of their role. For many leaders and managers, the list of needs above is overwhelming and way below the waterline. Maybe they're subject matter or technical experts who've been promoted into people management positions. Maybe they've not been trained and developed in the art and science of people management. Or maybe they've just burned out and have nothing more to give. It's time for change. Thanks for listening. And we hope that this conversation provided the insights and inspiration that you were looking for. We're on a mission to get the key messages about modern day leadership out to as many people as possible. So look, if you do listen regularly or enjoyed any of the episodes, please head over to your regular podcast platform, subscribe and give us a positive review. 
You can also find Authentic Leadership on YouTube on the Being Brain Smart channel. And before you go, if you'd like to know what I do when I'm not interviewing amazing guests, I facilitate, train, speak and coach on the neuroscience of leadership and change. To find out more, head over to the Brain Smart website. That's brain-smart.com to find out more about some of our programs or email me. That's Claire, C-L-A-R-E, at brain-smart.com. Go well, and thanks again for listening.